I've put together a summary sheet which um, sets out the key terms and also um, gives you an idea of the sort of the key concepts that the Act operates on. Hopefully you can use that as a bit of a cheat sheet when you're back in your offices and trying to work out what's going on, that that will give you an easy introduction in. So if you don't have it yet, make sure you grab a copy of this on the, the way back out. What we've done before the break is go through a summary of what the PPSA is about and the key terms and processes that it sets out. I want to, um, in the next 20 minutes or so, give you 10 keys to understanding the PPSA in a bit more detail so that you, um, you have a framework that you can work within. The first key to understand is how the, the transition provisions operate. Um, is we're now in the situation where the PPSA applies to security interest created um, from 30 January 2012. Um, but there's also transaction, um, transitional provisions that pick up um, security interests that existed prior to 30 January 2012. The reason the Act couldn't apply um, retrospectively to security interests was because of the constitutional requirements of um, if you're taking property from people, you have to do that on just terms. So rather than having to go through that process, what the government said is that if you... Um, if you had a security interest that existed prior to the commencement of the Act, then you're given a two-year period of grace, very kind of them, called a period of temporary perfection, which in which to assent to the new regime. Um, for constitutional reasons that I must admit I don't understand, after that two-year period, then your interest is going to be ineffective. The effect of the transitional provisions are that if you had... Um, a security interest that would have been a, a security interest registrable under the PPSA prior to the commencement of the Act, then um, for the two-year period, you get an opportunity to move that from the old to the new. So, for example, all of the, um, the company charges that were registered with ASIC under the, the old provisions in the, the Corps Act have now merged or morphed across to the, the PPSA regime and all of the, um, the charges that were registered and kept on a register maintained by ASIC um, have or should have gone across to the register that the PPSA puts in place. Um, now, a problem that arises, and it arises in part because of the way that the the register is struggling to, to cope with the, the influx of information, is that if you had a, um, a fixed and floating charge under the old corporations regime, then on one view you need do nothing with any haste because you have the benefit of the, the temporary protection period. And so as long as within the next two years that's um, brought into the new regime, then your clients will be um, protected. The issue comes, of course, of, well, what happens if it's not transferred across in the automatic process accurately or if it's not transferred across um, at all? So what we have been suggesting to people is that their clients go through a review process of making sure that all of their um, former security interests have transferred across into the new regime and that they do that as quickly as possible to avoid potential priority fights which might arise where you have a security interest that um, has the benefit of the temporary protection being in conflict with a security interest that has the benefit of the full protection under the Act. So um, I think it's in clients' interest to move their security interest from whatever old regime they're under into the new regime as quickly as possible and um, to make sure that any security interests which have been transferred across automatically have been um, transferred correctly. I should say on that that when I say automatically transferred across, the part of the process of shifting to the, the new regime is that a number of different um, asset registers which have been kept by various entities around the country, such as the, um, 
the company charges which are kept by ASIC or the various um, vehicle security registration registers which are kept by Vic Roads in Victoria or whoever else in the other states. A number of those are meant to um, automatically transfer across into the new regime. Um, clients would obviously be well advised to check to make sure that that actually happens and not just rely on it happening. The second um, important principle to understand is that the fundamental of property law that you can't give what you don't um, possess or what you don't have ownership to is um, removed by the, the Act because under the Act possession rather than ownership is um, enough to grant a security interest. Um, so again going back to the example where um, I borrow $10,000 from you and give you my mother's engagement ring as security for that. You don't own that ring, but you have it in your possession. If I don't go through the process of um, making sure that that security interest is all, has been registered and has been registered properly and is identifiable, then if that, if you then go and sell my mother's engagement ring to a um, pawnbroker or whoever, then you can do that because, and you can, or you can, sorry, I shouldn't say so, if you give it a security for a loan to someone else and they register that interest and they go through the perfection process, then that will take priority over my security interest if I haven't perfected it earlier in time because um, possession is sufficient in order to grant a security interest. The third key to understanding the PPSA is that um, there's no bona fide purchaser without notice principle. So under the general law, if you um, took the property free of any equitable interest, um, then you weren't bound by that unless you could be said to have some sort of constructive notice. Um, and the PPSA rules of extinguishment substitute this principle to make it much more akin to the Torrens registration of land system. So um, a perfected security that's been registered will, um, will trump an equitable interest or a, an unperfected security. And so then um, if there's no notice and if you can't look on the register and see whether the, the asset is being, um, being provided as collateral for a security interest, then you can um, take that asset free of any prior interest. So again, you can see how the way the Act is um, designed is to drive people into the situation where they, they go through a process of publicly registering their security interest in collateral so that the rest of the market can see when they take, when they give security, or when they take security and give loans that they um, can price their risk accordingly by knowing whether they are taking it um, first in line or second in line or third in line or, or whatever it may be. Um, as I said right at the start, the concept of property is very broad and it covers nearly all tangible and intangible personal property, including licences. I have set out there some of the things that um, it doesn't apply to. And again, if you're um, in one of these more uh, exotic areas, you'd be well advised to look at the Act and see whether it falls within the, the confines of the Act or perhaps more pertinently whether it falls outside the, the confines of the Act. The next thing to think about is the PPSA is designed to provide a unitary concept of security interest. Um, and that's really what I've been talking about as one of the driving forces through the act of um, making public what in the past has been very difficult to, to understand um, what security interests exist in what situation so that people can price, price risk. So the idea is that there is one spot that people go to in order to look to see whether there's security interests attached to um, particular assets. 
and they can then price their risk accordingly. Um, there's some changes to both the, the language, but also um, the language reflects a change in the conceptual approach to, to various classes of security. Um, and one of them is that the concept of crystallisation and the floating charge become irrelevant under the PPSA. This is quite a significant shift for people who deal with fixed and floating charges. Um, it comes from the, the abolishment of the old rule that um, you couldn't take, except under certain circumstances, security over future assets. So that um, the way that that was, was got around was that you would take a, a floating charge over all of the assets that would fix at a particular point in time on the event of a default. And at that point, all of the assets that form the, the body of the company would, um, would be the assets that you um, had a right to under the charge. That's, um, that's done away with under the PPSA. So um, there is now no longer a concept of crystallisation because you can take a charge over future assets that come into the company. That in turn gives rise to the need to have the super priority for the um, purchase money security interest, which we talked about earlier. Um, so it means that you take, or the, the security interest operates as a fixed security interest from the time of attachment um, over what's called circulating assets of the company. And that means that the company can continue to trade, but your right to the to those assets um, arises at the time of the, of the attachment. And that really is um, picked up in this seventh point here, which is that it covers future advances as well without limitation. Um, and that has a significant effect too for um, mortgagees who generally in the past couldn't tack on additional advances if there was actual notice of the existence of a second or substance security before those advances were made. Um, again, that's under the PPSA, that's shifted so that um, it's not necess necessary for the registration of a security interest to stipulate a maximum prospective liability. Um, you might want to do that in certain, certain circumstances, but it gives um, the first security holder a much greater advantage than they had under the, the old laws. Another thing that's, the eighth thing that's very important to understand when you're looking at the PPSA is that um, it relies a lot on the accuracy and the integrity of the, the register. And um, to do that, it, it adopts what's called an exact match registration system that places the premium on the accurate recording of the prescribed information in the registration of the security interest and accurate searching. Um, and that's from the reading I've done in terms of in relation to New Zealand, US and Canada. That is a difficult area for legal practitioners because if a client asks you to do um, searches to determine whether or not a, um, a company or a, a collateral is being given as a security interest for, for a loan, then if you don't get the searches right and you tell the client that there's no, um, there's no security interest that attaches to that collateral, then that um, exposes the firm to a, a liability situation. What seems to happen in the other countries is that people won't give an actual opinion on whether the collateral is security, is given as a security interest or not. What they will do is attach their searches and um, tell the client that these searches have been conducted and um, those searches don't disclose that there is any um, security interest attaching to that collateral. But you can see that it's, um, it's a minefield for, for us as practitioners where um, clients may or may not give you the the exact um, description of the collateral or if the um, serial number has been um, transposed or is incorrect either at 
your client's end or at the registration end, then there's a um, there's potential for a lot of confusion in that. So, um, and again, that's that's behind what I said in relation to the transition provisions. Our clients would be well advised to make sure that where their security interests have been transferred from one of the um, pre-existing registers across to the PPS register is to make sure that that has been transferred accurately to make sure that the serial numbers are correct, the description of the asset is correct, the description of the, the parties is are correct so that, um, for example, a search by ACN number will show up the right collateral and, um, and not slip through the, slip through the hoops. Um, I've said at the bottom there that misleading registrations are ineffective and outdated or misleading registrations can be amended or removed by an administrative or a judicial process. There are, um, there are two paths that you can take if you need to correct the register, if you need to remove um, collateral from the register. One is the administration process that I talked briefly about before the break where you give notice and then if it's not rectified within a certain um, number of days, then the registrar has to um, remove the item. The problem for that will be um, that won't be fast enough in lots of circumstances where clients might be trying to complete a deal and suddenly they find that um, a whole series of assets have been um, retained on the register as being collateral when in fact that's not the case. So there is a judicial process that you can go through where you need to, in circumstances where you need to move faster to have the the register reflect, reflect what's the, the accurate or the true position. Um, I think again the ninth point we've talked about before, I've mentioned before, it's um, the idea of the Act is to allow people to price their risk more accurately than they have in the past um, and to find out who claims security interest in, in various pieces of collateral. And um, the last point is that, again, it's a conceptual point, is that the idea of the Act is that it's meant to respect the marketplace and let um, the market dictate how security interests are um, granted, priced, what collateral is put up for interest, rather than having a series of different prescriptive um, regimes at both state and federal level to deal with that. Um, In the couple of minutes that I've got left, let me talk just briefly about two other things. The first is extinguishment. And the, the PPSA sets out a number of rules under which a person can acquire collateral free of a security interest. Um, an example of that is a buyer or lessee of personal property, full value, will take the property free of any unperfected security interest unless the buyer or lessee was a party to the original transaction. So that's the idea of um, if, you, if you haven't perfected your security interest, then you're at risk of losing your security in events where someone else takes the property um, free, of, free of that. And even if they have constructive knowledge of that situation, that won't be sufficient under the Act to, um, to enliven the the equitable jurisdiction as we would have talked about it in the past. Um, there's a carve out unless they were a party to the original transaction, but the exposure is there of for extinguishment for an unperfected security interest. Second point is that a buyer or lessee of a serial number property, which is for most relevantly for most of us will be motor vehicles, will take the property free of a security interest if a search of the register by reference to serial number, immediately before the sale, would not have disclosed a registration. Um, the search doesn't actually have to be conducted, but if the search would have been conducted and if the search would not have shown that that motor vehicle described by its serial number was collateral for a security interest, then the buyer takes that free of any previous encumbrance. So the obligation there is very much on, the, in most cases, the financing company to make sure that the um, motor vehicle which they've taken as collateral has been accurately described by serial number 
um, because otherwise they're at, at significant risk that they will not be able to enforce their security in a subsequent sale. Um, that doesn't apply to sales or leases in the ordinary course of business outside of the motor vehicle trading industry. It doesn't apply to low value personal use property under $5,000. So if you're buying something on eBay and it's under $5,000, then um, those extinguishment rules don't apply. But if it's more than $5,000, then that's something that people need to be aware of. And it um, doesn't apply to transfers on the stock exchange. So um, if there's been share mortgages that have been granted, then um, that doesn't apply because the volume of trading would make that an impossible thing to enforce. Um, and finally, just let me touch on the enforcement provisions, which you'll find in Chapter 4 of the Act. Again, consistent with the idea that the, the Act is designed to let the market regulate how securities operate, um, parties are free to um, negotiate their own contractual terms so long as they don't conflict with the PPSA or other laws. So that means there's, um, there's no need to obtain any judgment under the PPSA before you enforce security interests. There is an obligation to um, exercise your, your rights under the PPSA honestly and in a commercially reasonable manner. Um, Immediately you can see that there's a difficulty that rises there because the requirement for honesty is going to be a subjective one and um, what will be held to be a commercially reasonable manner is something that um, over time the courts will give us some guidance on. It's not readily apparent what that might mean um, in terms of how parties are meant to conduct themselves um, when they're enforcing their securities. Um, and importantly, the, the enforcement regime that's set out in Chapter 4, which um, has the administrative process that I talked about, it also has the, the judicial process of um, taking various steps, is not a comprehensive code, and it doesn't apply, for example, where the property is in the hands of a receiver um, or to various deemed security interests, which I appreciate I've only touched on very briefly or if the goods are outside of Australia. So um, again, when you get to a situation where you're looking to enforce your um, rights under a security agreement, then you'll have to have regard to Chapter 4 provisions. You'll also have to have regard to the, the remainder of the law on enforcement of securities, and you'll have to work out um, whether you can rely on the Chapter 4 provisions or whether you fall outside the scope of the Chapter 4 provisions. Um, the parties can contract out of some but not all of the provisions. Section 115 of the Act sets out what you can and can't contract out of. And finally, um, there are specific rules in relation to the seizure of intangible property and that's, um, there's a process that needs to be gone through if you're trying to seize some um, trademarks or some other patents or other IPs, and um, but again, that that's set out in the in the provisions of the Act. So, what I hope to have done today is to have given you a, an overview of the Act. It's um, it is a radical piece of legislation. Um, over time, I suspect that we'll all become very familiar with it. But it seems to me that in the meantime, there's um, there's a lot of scope for. Um, us as lawyers to give real value to our clients in terms of protecting their security interests and um, putting our clients in a position where they can best take advantage of, of the benefits that the Act will provide to people and particularly early on in circumstances where, um, where other people might not be so fast off the mark in terms of their use of the Act. Thank you very much. Adrian, um Thank you very much for what was a, an extremely well-prepared, um, informative and extremely helpful uh, presentation on a difficult um, piece of uh, legislation. Uh, we can all leave today um, better informed about how the PPSA works. So if you will join me in thanking Adrian once again.